I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today is part two of my Bloodborne area rankings, where I reveal my top 10 areas in Bloodborne. Did you miss part one? Click the card in the top right corner. Because when one video ends, you just open up another one. It's called binge viewing. Go ahead, I support you. But before we get started, did you know that only 2% of my viewers are subscribed to the channel? Let's rectify that. I'm trying to reach 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2023, and I know we can do it. So parry that subscribe button and you can stay notified about future Soulsborne videos. Without further ado, let's discuss my top 10 Bloodborne areas, and be sure to leave your thoughts respectfully in the comments below. My pick for the most underrated area in Bloodborne goes to Hemwick Charnel Lane. Just west of the Grand Cathedral and through the forest of snipers and hounds, this land is ruled by the hardest bosses in the game, the Witches of Hemwick. There's nothing like opening the gate to the lamp and seeing that surprisingly gorgeous vista of the upcoming area. Hills and buildings stretching across the horizon, with the Witches' abode looming ominously in the distance. As you take your first steps down, you're greeted by dancing hags, gleefully going about their evening. It's one o'clock, baby! It's striking having a mainly woman-dominated area, and it's a refreshing change after cutting through all of those men in central Yharnam. Why I like Hemwick is that despite the linearity of the level design, you're going through various different environments in a fun, twisty way that wraps back around to the main road. It's set up exactly the same as the Undead Parish from Dark Souls and the Inner Ward from Demon Souls, areas that are considered extreme fan favorites in the community. And yet Hemwick is slammed because I have to assume the boss is bad? I think the enemy variety and placement, especially if you have higher insight, is fun to handle and fairly inspired. There's a nice shortcut midway through the level to make life easier if you die, though I've admittedly never had to use it. You're going up through hills, through dark barns, across rooftops, and out to the road leading to your destination. And while I don't take bosses into account for this series, boss arenas are fair game, and the Witch's Arena is this horrifying workshop of corpses hanging from the ceiling, rounded off with a tortured hunter in a dark, enclosed room. Hemwick Charnel Lane is a cemetery, and if you dig deeper into the lore, it's even the place where the bone marrow ash item is manufactured for Yharnam. Pretty cool for an area most people gloss over. Assess the area without focusing on the poor quality of the boss next time you play, and I guarantee you'll have a lot more fun. At number 9, my most controversial Bloodborne take, I don't mind the village from Resident Evil 4, I, I mean Bloodborne's Forbidden Woods. Or I should say it's a tale of two halves with this area. The first half of the level takes place in a hidden hamlet in the forest, Traps galore, though they're easy to dodge. There's a series of ramshackle wooden buildings where you can approach from almost any angle. Want to drop onto an alley near the main square? Take this path and let gravity do its work. Or strut through the main gate and mow down every villager in your way. Feel like being sneaky? Go over the hill, up past the dog cages. You might even find a secret poison cave leading back to central Yharnam, as well as a series of rooftops and bridges that take you over a river of flammable oil. You're rewarded for exploring with so many little nooks and crannies. It's absolutely fantastic level design, ending with a straight stretch of road with a cannon at the end. First time players will be scared, but you can literally run straight for the cannon and you won't get hit. And you can use it too. Well, that was disappointing. Once you enter the windmill and descend to the second half of the level though, that's where things get messy. It's like somebody saw the Las Blagas from Resident Evil 4 and said, what about snakes though? The second half of Forbidden Woods is just not as fun. Whereas the enemy placement in the first half felt purposeful, the enemy placement down here feels overwhelming. The forest becomes a maze, and it's incredibly difficult to figure out where you've been, where you're going, or what you're even trying to reach. On the plus side, there's a small chasm that introduces you to the kin enemies for the first time, a small taste of the Lovecraftian undertones about to assault your palate. And the aesthetic of the various different graves and crypts dotted across the landscape is striking. 
but I just can't get over how irritating the enemies here are to fight. There's also a shortcut that doesn't even need to exist in this elevator on screen now, given after two or three big pigs, you then unlock a gate that opens up a quicker boss run back. However, I think the first half of Forbidden Woods is so strong that it balances out the second half, placing this area perfectly in the middle of my overall rankings. Just like the painted world of Ariamis, which also came in 8th place in my Dark Souls area rankings, cards in the top right corner, check those videos out, the research hall from the Old Hunters DLC suffers from the same issues para mi, being that on the positive, the level layout is genius, one of From Software's best vertical mazes they've ever created. There are so many different paths to take, staircases to climb, items to find, and every room seems to be connected in some way to somewhere else. You always have a path to go down, and there's always more places to explore. Doubly so when you realize that towards the end of the level, you change the elevation of the main staircase, allowing you to reach the area bosses, and giving you access to even more rooms to check out. The shortcuts are well placed, there are some fun shelving traps to avoid, and there's even a secret path leading to the Lumen Flower Garden from the Celestial Emissary fight, where you can find the Black Sky Eye spell. And you even get to break the window back into the main cathedral, which I guess I'll count as part of the research hall. So in that case, before even reaching the main part of the level, you get to fight the human form of Vicar Amelia, her bodyguard, and you can obtain Lawrence's skull here. This is on top of the quest lines for the Milkweed Rune, involving a lot of brain fluid. So after all those praises, why is this area at number 8? The simple answer, I despise the enemies of the research hall. I know that the game is implying you should use blue elixir to make it past the hordes, but that's just not how Bloodborne is made to be played. You want to fight new enemies, test out all your new weapons, and then you get stunlocked by the most basic enemies who do insane damage despite being leveled very well, and at some point it goes from being a fun experience to being a cheap experience. The larger patients with the IVs don't appear much, but when they do, I get scared. And the less I say about the old codger with the Gatling gun, the better. I just couldn't get to grips with handling the enemies in this location, and I found myself getting incredibly frustrated, making simple mistakes, getting, as the kids would say, hashtag tilted towers. When I think about the DLC, it's the one area of the three where I just think, I don't really want to replay that, even if the level design is god tier. And then I remember the Lady Maria fight, and I think, fine. If you were to ask me, I'd say Bloodborne's early game has a surprising level of polish and consistency, and Old Yarnum, our number seven spot, is no exception. A descent into the Valley Hamlet to collect a chalice needed for the ancient hunter practice of communion. This area is drenched in lore. The ground zero for the Scourge of the Beasts, Old Yarnum was burned to the ground by the church, and an ashen cold mist coats the valley floor. Pyres are lit throughout, burning endlessly through the night, and you, a hunter, are warned at the door not to enter, and once again by Jura from atop his tower. Leave. Now. Of course you don't, which results in being pelted with a Gatling gun and being forced to duck and dive through the various dilapidated buildings until you reach a point where Jura can't shoot you. There's a basic hunter enemy here who's famous for his ability to moonwalk, quite the spectacular skill set. And while you may be tempted to head up the clock tower and kill Jura now, leave him alive, as if you re-enter Yarnum after defeating Dark Beast Paul later in the game and make your way up to him, he'll be friendly and provide you with a badge for the shop. I like that the Gatling segment doesn't last terribly long, and the tone of the area shifts completely as you head to Lower Yarnum. A large grand cathedral with a monstrous effigy erected at its center, poisonous beasts who want to tear at you while hiding their faces from the light, and right before Old Yarnum, you are given antidotes on a corpse, so the game is already training you to prepare for that poison. The lower streets are like a tense horror experience. It's quiet. Too quiet. And then a wolf pounces through a door, attempting to claw at you, and also opening a shortcut nice. A mist ascends from drainage pipes, concealing those who would harm you. There's a specific alley where if you approach, the monster inside will roar, and it's scary until you walk through the fog and realize it's literally just a normal enemy. <laughs> 
culminating in one of the most intimidating boss area approaches in any game. You can't tell me when you first played Bloodborne that walking down to the church of the blood-starved beast didn't put you in fight or flight mode. And I love that you can see old Yarnum from Central Yarnum. In fact, when you go down to kill the pig in the sewer in Central, you're right next to the blood-starved beast church. Awesome! If only there were a shortcut from the church back up to Central Yarnum, that might have made this area top 5 worthy. But as it stands, an amazing location to explore that focuses on intimidating you as you descend from the warm rooftops to the cold, dark, burn streets below. Just missing out on my top 5 Bloodborne areas, we have Cathedral Ward. This is the Firelink Shrine of Yharnam, in the sense that a majority of the areas you'll be visiting are connected via Cathedral Ward. Central Yharnam, Old Yharnam, Hemwick Charnel Lane, the Healing Church Workshop and Upper Cathedral Ward, the Hypogean Jail, Yaha Ghoul, the Forbidden Woods, the Lecture Building through Patches Amygdala, and the DLC. Yet for how interconnected this area is, it's pretty simple. The layout is sloped, so you're always heading upwards towards the Grand Cathedral. There are offshoots that take you to optional paths like this overlook, which ends in a door that is theorized to connect to the Cleric Beast Central Yarnum Lamp. No idea why they didn't follow through on that, but I digress. The church officials are great enemies to fight, as they'll teach you how to parry effectively, as they can be parried at any point during their attack animations. And then the church giants are a nice test of strength, as they get easier and easier the further into the game you get. Now, you can't explore the full ward immediately. You either have to complete Old Yarnum and progress through the Healing Church Workshop, or purchase the Hunter Chief Emblem from the shop in the Hunter's Dream after beating the Cleric Beast. Either way, we'll give you access to the second half of the level, complete with some side quest content for Ariana and her neighbor, as well as access to a few side streets, a very good blood gem on a corpse near the Forbidden Woods entrance, and the Forbidden Woods entrance. Plus access to Hemwick, the path leading down to Yaha Ghoul, which has some good upgrade materials, and two hunters to fight. There's a lot to explore here on a first playthrough, but the magic loses its luster on repeats. I do love going back to Erden Chapel and seeing who we've saved, only to then return after the Blood Moon to discover an amygdala has been vibing above them the entire time. You also get the hardest fight in the game, the Bloody Crow of Kanehurst, if you've progressed Eileen's questline, and nobody will blame you for sprinkling that gesso. A lot of great moments, so much so that the DLC even takes aspects of Cathedral Ward's layout and refreshes them for you. It's the area people think of when they think Bloodborne, but I just prefer the rest of the levels that tiny bit more. Starting off our top 5 areas in Bloodborne, let's take a trip in a beautiful horse-drawn carriage to the Forsaken Castle Kanehurst. A splash of gothic vampiric horror hidden on a remote isle past Hemwick Charnel Lane. This area, once considered the best in Bloodborne many moons ago, is an optional location home to the Vilebloods, sworn enemies of the church. And when we arrive, all we find are vile bloodlickers roaming the crags and ghosts haunting the halls. Be sure to grab the area lamp, it's actually easy to miss in the snow. There are some good upgrade materials, a few new weapons, and should you join the Covenant at the end, you gain access to the Chikage Katana, a favorite of the community. The castle itself is a fairly linear experience drenched in atmosphere. You'll enter the main doors and find yourself working your way anti-clockwise around the dining halls, ancient battlements, and finally, a large sprawling library. The ghost enemies are fun to fight, and if you arrive late in the game, are easily stunnable. You also have the return of classic Souls series gargoyles, because we can't have a Soulsborne game without a gargoyle. I'm not a fan of the Kanehurst servant enemies though. They're small, spindly, and some shoot ranged projectiles that are almost invisible to the naked eye. Even worse when you realize they inflict status ailments. Yeesh. You can also perform an area skip that lets you access the main shortcut of the library without needing to go outside, which is useful for speedruns and feels great when you're just rushing to reach the boss. My favorite aspect of Kanehurst, though, is both its verticality and its willingness to play with expectations. 
you're constantly swapping from lavish inner halls to snow-covered rooftops and battlements, ending in one of my favorite boss runbacks where you drop across snow-tipped spires until you reach the furthest castle. This culminates in one of my favorite boss arenas, a dark gothic rooftop with a few barriers to avoid attacks and a gorgeous view of the world around you. And once you obtain the Crown of Illusions, access to the Vile Blood Queen's throne room. Kanehurst takes a top five spot for having a completely different atmosphere to the rest of Yharnam's offerings, taking the gothic horror and going in a Dracula direction that manages to feel right at home in Bloodborne's world. Had the level been a bit more open-ended in the first half, it may have made its way into my top four or even three, but fifth place is nothing to sneeze at. In previous area rankings, I never included hubs as part of my top five. This is because I wanted actual levels to stand out in place of the hub areas you came back to for stocking up on items or upgrading your gear. Yet, as I prepared to put Hunter's Dream in sixth place for consistency, I couldn't bring myself to do it. There's something so quaint yet eerie about Bloodborne's hub. There's a sense that this is where you belong and it's a safe space for the player, yet you shouldn't be here. An ominous tinge on the fringes of your mind telling you this isn't right. Of course, discovering this dream was ran by the Moon Presence late into the game, as well as knowing that German was trapped in the dream forced to serve Hunter's past, validates those feelings of unease. The cute cottage exterior and the cozy workshop interior allow you to feel comfortable, paired perfectly with this hub's iconic theme. You could AFK in this area and just listen for a moment, only to find it's been an hour. But the reason this area cracks my top five is the reveal of the boss arena. Without discussing the actual fights, the arena is this enchanting field of white flowers, very reminiscent of Metal Gear Solid 3's final boss, complete with a large gnarled tree at the top of the hill. Lining the walls of this arena are the gravestones of those who came before, hunters just like you who became trapped in the dream. It's tempting to just delay the inevitable and relax in the field before speaking with German, enjoying the beautiful skybox above that reminds me so much of Ash Lake, with the trees jutting into the sky in the distance. I don't know if The Hunter's Dream is my favorite hub in the Soulsborne series, perhaps I'll do a hub ranking one day, but what other hub in the series has the final boss arena just sitting there, waiting to be revealed at the end of your journey? I love that. FromSoft was on something good when they developed the Old Hunters DLC, and The Hunter's Nightmare is the first impression that had us all gagging from the quality. This mishmash of locations from The Waking World is a perverse recreation of the Yharnam we know and love, but turned into a haven for hunters to fall victim to their own madness. Starting in a ruined cathedral ward, the layout is mostly the same, with gnarled hills and mounds jutting to change the landscape. New hunter enemies lie in wait, strong enough to deter those from exploring the DLC early, while being manageable enough that you can enjoy that fun hunter-on-hunter -hunter experience Bloodborne knows is its best feature. I love how the beasts of this realm are haggard and withered, starved of blood and hunted by the hunters. Further up at the Grand Cathedral, we meet our first Nightmare Executioner, and these Cthulhu-looking asses are no joke, some of the toughest enemies in the game. You can find them here and towards the end of the area, and I'll admit I just don't fight them on the lead up to Ludwig, they're too scary. My favorite part of the level, however, is the homage to Central Yharnam, the Deep Valley Hamlet replaced with a striking River of Blood. The Checkpoint House we all know and love, as well as the Central Yharnam Lamp, being focal areas you can visit. Gotta love how they play you with that explosive trap. There's the hidden cave at the far back of the river, complete with a Gatling gun hunter and a blood-starved beast, which I loved seeing the reactions to back in the day. I'm so devious. The latter third of the level is this winding series of climbing atop buildings, moving through blood-soaked streets, and slaying the hunters you come across until you reach the blood lake leading to Ludwig. And even then, you have tons of optional paths leading to new weapons and items to find. Because the Hunter's Nightmare is jam-packed with countless new weapons to try out, including the infamous pizza cutter itself, the Whirligig Saw, among others. In that sense, it's worth visiting and rushing the DLC early so you can get yourself a cool weapon before tackling the rest of the game. 
capped off with one of the most iconic boss arenas in the series with the underground corpse pile. A true aesthetic vibe if I do say so myself. Our runner-up on today's list is the Fishing Hamlet, the final area of the Bloodborne DLC and the most unique area in the entire game in terms of atmosphere, enemy design, color palette, the lot. Upon unlocking the clock tower, you descend a small drop into a little fishing hamlet, stormy and grey with blues and pale yellows lighting the skies. It's a true Lovecraftian moment, an area clearly inspired by the shadow over Innsmouth, and a great reveal since up to this point you have no idea what you're expecting to find. Fishmen litter the streets, fish dogs will charge at you, fish mages fire electricity, and the less we say about the infamous fish giants, the better. Fun to fight on their own, but we all know why they're so hated. That well, that damned well. I'll take my fish with a side of prime mature cheddar kiss, oh thank you very much, nom 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 nom. The fishing hamlet manages to play with verticality in a fun way, taking a fairly compact area and making it feel larger than life. You'll be traveling through the town's streets, up the hill to the first lamp, and then across rooftops, through caves, down ladders and drops, there's so much to see and explore. Optional paths galore, invasions by Braydor, how could you want more? There's something very striking when you first travel through one of the lower caves, stepping on all these dead fish, until you realize they're not actually fish but instead alien slugs. It's harrowing as you get closer and closer to your goal as everything takes a turn for the horror. But then there are these moments of peace. I like how you can see the corpse of Kos, or some say Cosm, from an overlook near the lamp, giving you this what the fuck is that moment, while also allowing you to see your destination. As someone who knew what was waiting for me under that corpse, it actually added to the intimidation factor, and the boss arena is one of my favorites in the series, a windswept stormy beach with the fractured moon hanging low. But you can hear more about that in my boss ranking video, click the card in the top right corner for more. The Fishing Hamlet is just such a unique experience within both Bloodborne and the Soulsborne games, I can't think of an area that gives off quite the same vibe, and its aesthetic is just perfect for me. I love the rain, I love the cloudy weather, I love darker colours. Let me live here from soft, I will become fish. But my favourite area in Bloodborne is a masterclass in what makes these games so damn great. How could it be anywhere else but the GOAT, the best opening level in any From Software game, Central Yharnam. Talk about making a first impression. So many people came into Bloodborne uncertain and scared, only to start exploring the cobbled streets of Yharnam and feeling themselves coming around to its unique blend of gothic horror action. From a level design standpoint, Central Yharnam is actually insane. So many optional paths to explore, secret sewers, small drops that lead to completely different areas, hidden items and NPCs to discover, an entirely optional boss at the end of the main bridge, countless Yharnamites to cut through as they teach you to be aggressive, be, be aggressive. If you can make it through that first impactful mob in the streets, you'll be fine. The wolves atop the bridge act as skill barriers, holding back those who can't hack their movesets, but can be bypassed if you make your way around the streets to the shortcut house below. You might get shot by an old man in a wheelchair, one of the funniest opening moments in the game, but you'll always make your way back to your opening lamp. Truly inspired level design that focuses on a single point will always impress me. You can fist a giant pig in the sewers, which can lead to a tragic end for a quest line later down the line, and don't get me started on the Tomb of Erden Boss Arena, a disturbing graveyard with no rhyme or reason given to its graves, erected as the dead began to pile up. From central Yharnam, you can look down and see old Yharnam below, and even get close to the Church of the Good Chalice. Yes, I brought this up a few entries ago, I'm bringing it up again. Or you can look out towards buildings yonder where Yahargul lays hidden. Cathedral Ward hangs above you, the Grand Cathedral, the tallest building in the town, and your primary goal as you stare from the streets below. 
But perhaps the ballsiest part of Central Yharnam is how you can't level up for a majority of the area, unless you encounter one of the two bosses or discover some madman's knowledge items in the furthest sewers among the rats. You're forced to fight through these streets with your base stats. They did this in Demon Souls as well, forcing you to beat 1-1 before you could level up, and once again, the concept works wonders for forcing players to learn the game's mechanics instead of grinding early to kill everything in one hit. And while I don't want to talk about boss fights, I can't help but admire how Gascoigne is genuinely this final exam on whether you've learned Bloodborne's mechanics. And if you can't beat him, well, the game sends you back to Central Yharnam to figure out what you've learned. Gatekeeping is a term that has received a lot of negative connotations, especially when a lot of gaming media is advocating for accessibility options in every video game. And I am a supporter of those options, especially allowing people with various disabilities to be able to enjoy these games that we love so much. But at the same time, that isn't an excuse to make every game have an easy mode, because not every game needs one. The inherent charm of Soulsborne games is the overcoming of adversity, and once you understand Bloodborne's mechanics, which are admittedly at odds with the rest of From Software's catalogue, combat will begin to flow better. This is a game that doesn't handhold the player, it respects that you will learn its mechanics for better or for worse, and Central Yharnam embodies this spirit beautifully on top of being one of FromSoft's best designed levels in any of their games. That is why Central Yharnam is my favorite Bloodborne area. But what's your favorite Bloodborne area? Did I miss any reasons for why an area is cool? Let me know in the comments down below. My socials are on screen now, feel free to follow where you feel comfortable, I recommend my Twitter. Thank you once again to my patrons for another month of support, you are the best people in the world, and I'll see you all next week for another video. Adios.